finally, uh, we are going like, to close like uh, this event like with a workshop tutorial, right? Like uh, about computational law. So I'm going to introduce like to two guys. One is Brian, the other is Dasa. Like they uh, belong to the uh, connection science like a uh, group and also human dynamics. And then they are experts like in MIT, like about how to mix the world of like technology, like cryptography, like blockchain, and also law, which is like a big thing that we don't tend to like uh, care, you know, uh, but it's like a, a thing that really matters, right? So without further delay, I'm going to like uh, let them like uh, well, thanks. start. Speaking of technology, we're getting the clicker. Um, yeah, so I'm, of the two, I'm Daza. Uh, this is Brian. Um, right. uh, I, I run something called law.mit.edu, which has been the wrapper for computational law research here at MIT, and we're housed uh, in the Human Dynamics Lab, Sandy Pentland's lab. Um, and uh, we're about to launch a new publication, the computation, MIT Computational Law Report, which you'll hear a little bit more about in a moment. But th this um, research into robotics, AI, and law actually goes back a ways. You'll hear toward the end of a presentation, um, roots back in 2011 when we started modeling uh, autonomous uh, legal corporations and sort of a steady flow. And we're finally at the point now with the launch of this publication where things are coming together. So it's the perfect time to speak with you about it. And we want to hear back from some of you, your impressions and, and questions as well. So uh, with that, uh, Brian. Let's take it away. Boom. So uh, yeah, we, we have this idea of like uh, DAOs plus robots equals, you know. Um, and what we've really been working on lately is this idea of automated on, and autonomous legal entities. And so what that means is, you know, we have to kind of embed the legal thinking from the get go so that we can optimize the protections of the legal system with these new, new forms of entities that people are coming up with. Um, because there are going to be all these different questions that start to arise. So who owns the entity? Who owns the IP? How is anything produced? How are any proceeds divided? our material source, who is capable of entering into contracts for a DAO? Like, what happens if the DAO does something illegal? Um, what happens if the DAO goes bankrupt? Like, these are all things that you, you don't really think about when you're setting something that's, like, really creative up. It's, uh, it's mostly on the back burner. And so we wanted to start showing why this, thing, this type of thinking is important to, like, get in front of, it, it's important to get in front of this type of thinking ahead of time instead of when everything hits the fan. <laughs> right, um, and so one of the kind of questions embedded here, I think the, the way we phrased it is, uh, um, who is capable of entering into contracts for the DAO, like on behalf of or the behest of the DAO? And that raises this sort of deeper, almost philosophical question, when, if ever, is a DAO capable of forming contracts itself? When would or should or could a DAO be considered and treated as a legal entity itself and therefore capable of forming contracts, enforcing contracts, having them forced against it? Um, and, and so um, the answer to this kind of, uh, we, we break it down into a few different pieces, but uh, one of the key pieces that you were touching on there was the, the idea of legal personality rights, the idea that you can have like a limitation of liability that creates a separate legal entity apart from yourself and gives you something that you can kind of hide behind in, in the form of a liability limitation. Um, then we get to the notion of investment and in securities, um, contracts and intellectual property, contracts and agency law, and then tort. Um, and then we have some uh, different use cases that we walk through and kind of talk about how they apply. Yeah, so this is the roadmap for the next like 15 minutes, not for 2020. <laughs> Um, so generally, like, the container of legal personality rights requires a few of, like, these common ingredients. Um, so registration with the state, identification of certain governance mechanisms, like with a DAO, that could be, like, the, the voting mechanisms or, or things like that. Um, the identification of the individuals who are in charge of administering the governance mechanisms. Um, certain states call this a custodian. Um, and then the legal protection within some narrow purpose. So you have to be operating within some specific legal purpose um, and you only get those, these protections if you're, you fit within that container. Yeah, and just to <clears throat> break this down a little so you know what we're talking about, registration with the state speaks to, like how many people have ever formed a corporation or an LLC? 
so a smattering. So you know, there's that step where you somebody goes to the Secretary of State's office if it's in the United States, fills out a form. You know, there's always a check involved. They need their money, and then they will like create the corporation for you. You get a corporate ID. You could check the state database of corporations, and you know, the name will show up along with like who the directors are. Um, that's this registration process. There is just I think it's noteworthy. We had a rep, we had a uh, kind of a law and technology conference here not long ago where one of the presenters was very interested in a different way of creating legal personality that doesn't require registration with the state initially. And it's a, called a Massachusetts Business Trust. So that just requires a trust agreement where the parties to the trust um, sign something and it's a legal entity. Although when we explored it, it turned out you know, in order to maintain its existence and to pay the taxes and to dissolve it, you ended up having to do the registration with the state. So it does seem like that first bullet is is um, something that's within the scope of what an automated system would, a capability it would need to have in order to incorporate itself. Yeah, and, and another thing to point out, I think, at this stage is that some of these protections are at the state level and some are at the federal level. Um, so in, in the U.S., you know, you'll have different state protections that are related to, like, business entity but you'll have federal protections that are related to like securities law. Indeed. So it's, it's important to know like a, which domain you're operating in in order to kind of like optimize for that domain. Yeah, we should probably disclose we're operating within, within those different levels. We're very much US centric for, for this conversation. Although as you'll see toward the end, we've been dabbling and collaborating with people in Europe and other countries. Yep. Okay. And so uh, one of the most progressive states in this regard is Vermont. They have a BBLLC statute, a blockchain-based limited liability company. And with that, um, you register with the state. The state reviews your operating agreement to ensure the safety and access of the permission protocols. You have a summary of that mission and purpose, like I talked about. Um, and then there is some indication as to whether the BBLLC is fully automated or partially automated. And then you specify the, the voting protocols. And the way that this has played out so far um, with this organization called DORG, um, they set up their operating agreement, they paid the fee, they indicated what their uh, different governance type was. Uh, you can see. Decentralized ledger, and then they describe it. Um, and so I, I, <laughs> I wanted to highlight that, but the, it's not showing up very well. Oh. Um, but yeah, and, and then other states follow approximately the, the same recipe that I laid out. Um, so with Delaware, um, the way that they got to the end result is a little bit different. Instead of having a standalone business entity, they allow uh, the use of electronic networks or databases to administer different of the existing corporate functions. So stock ownership, books and records, voting, and um, one thing to note that's potentially interesting here is that Delaware corporate law permits the registration of series entities. So if you have an entity that's nested like a thousand times as like sh these shell entities, you can, you can set that up theoretically um, in the state of Delaware. Um, one way that this is playing out is through the Lau, um, which is a legal investment fund or, or a legally compliant DAO for investments. Um, and specifically with them, that would be another instance where you would have to also go through the, um, the IRS's requirements for securities registration. And I think all the members of this DAO have to be accredited investors. So that's like an additional protection that you get because you're an investor in a company. And so you have to meet these even more advanced, uh, even this more advanced threshold. Um, we should probably say the DORG is um, a project from um, a kind of a civic hacking group in Brooklyn. The Lao is a project of consensus and their open law spoke. Um, we've got a bunch of sites if you want to follow up on any of this. And, and these slides will all be available. I'll tweet a link out to them so that everybody can just use them and play around with them. Um, and then Wyoming has done something similar to what Delaware did. They they set it up so that certificate tokens could be issued instead of stock. Um, one of the interesting things that Wyoming has also done is they set up a, a special purpose depository bank for crypto transactions. So now you have a specific place you can go where you can kind of hold these things it, using some smart contract framework as a way to, uh, as a way to, you know, keep assets and keep, keep track of all your crypto assets. 
um, essentially. And uh, one of the ways that uh, this is kind of playing out is through Lasso DAO. Um, I, I believe they're uh, somehow involved in co-working as well, along with Dorg. Um, but this kind of gets us into the next bit that I was talking about earlier. Um, with investments in securities, this is governed by the IRS. Um, the big question here is, is something a utility token or security token? SEC. Oh, SEC, sorry. That was a, that was a mistake. Um, but the, the big question here is, um, you know, does it meet the Howey test? Is there any, you know, are you putting money into uh, an entity with the expectation that people in that entity will do work on your behalf and give you some return? Um, and so if so, you know, you need to make sure you're compliant. Um, otherwise, you know, the SEC can go after you and you can do something like what Pocket Full of Quarters did where they sought a new action letter by proving that they were utility instead of security and they're one of only two uh, companies in the U.S. that have uh, successfully beat like a no action letter. Right. So, so just curious, who, who's heard of a no action letter? Okay, so just FYI, what we're talking about right now is um, you could just go and do something um, and believe or hope it's not a security and discover later that the Securities and Exchange Commission believes it is, and then they can launch an enforcement action against you. That's a bad day. Um, you, on the other hand, could sort of um, get proactive with legally structuring things, um, and um, that's very much the spirit of how we treat um, uh, computational law is designing legal processes, you know, and engineering law and legal processes up front. And uh, one of the mechanisms you could use in this case is called a no action letter. That's basically when you go to the regulator, uh, SEC if it's federal, there's also state securities regulators, and um, explain in detail what you're planning to do and ask them if they will basically issue a no action letter, and they sometimes will, and that will give you almost like a little safe harbor uh, to, to do this, like they know what you're what you're doing in advance, they agree that it's okay, and sometimes they'll issue more of these when they want to encourage uh, more experimentation. Uh, during a bunch of legal hackathons that we had done a couple of years ago, including um, creating um, like revolving loan funds and other investment vehicles uh, through DAOs, part of the um, criteria for hacking teams was that they have lawyers, it was a legal hackathon on their team, and that they structure a request for a no action letter right with their code. So describing and documenting what the code is, who the investors would be, you know, what the protections and safeguards would be and so forth. So we're looking at ways to embed that within the process. And here's an example of, of, of a company where they've actually got no action letter from the SEC. And this is a good practice when you're creating your robot AI investment funds. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, the next kind of issue that we can um, run into, and, and I think uh, as a touched on something that's kind of like a theme is when you're more proactive, you have more flexibility. And so with regard to like the intellectual property rights, you know, you, you can set a lot of this stuff up by contract and a lot of this stuff is set up by contract, a contract among the members, a contract between the individual and the state, um, some sort of letter that functions as the proxy of a contract between the people and the SEC, for example. And, and, I, and with intellectual property, it's especially interesting because you, know, you can start dividing fractional ownership rights using ERC-721 tokens and then different people can like programmatically verify that they own part of an entity or part of the intellectual property of an entity or you know whatever however you want to slice it and uh, that that really gives people a more granular control over all of these things and, and it provides new opportunities that people hadn't had before and so uh, in another context you know if you look at contracts and agency this is a typical example of you know, what an agency relationship is. Um, you have a principal, the principal, you know, has the agent do some task, the agent goes to a third party to effectuate that task, and they can either be acting with express authority, inherent authority, or implied authority. And, and basically what that means is I can say, hey, you know, you're authorized to go to buy, uh, you know, a bunch of watermelons. Um, and you can, and you have the actual authority to go buy the watermelons. I can say you have the actual authority to go buy produce, mm -hmm. and so by buying watermelons, you would have that inherent authority, or you would have inherent authority to buy produce. 
But if I said you can go buy furniture and you come back with a bunch of watermelons right. and you work at a furniture store or you work at a produce store, you would kind of have that inherent or in the implied authority of having, you know, me being at a produce store. It would make sense that I could actually go buy, go and buy that. And so the third party wouldn't have to like the third party wouldn't have to go after the agent in that or they wouldn't have the ability to go after the agent in that situation. Yeah, perhaps. So it gets down to what a... So just to, another example, and maybe even more familiar uh, than furniture and watermelons, is like a house. So you've got a broker. Um, it's not uncommon to get a broker to sell your house. Um, the broker is a kind of... Or a broker or an agent, like literally a real estate agent. So that word is what we're talking about. Um, and so you'll usually have an agency agreement with them, and they're authorized to do certain things like go and solicit offers and maybe even do more than that, maybe get pre-approvals on loans in some cases, or they can go deeper. Um, you could structure it even more deeply to give them a let, uh, uh, like a um, uh, a um, letter of um, I'll kind of blank on the word, but you can make them like a, uh, what is it called? Give them um, it essentially certifies attorney. that you're authorized. You could give them a, yeah. what is it when you power of attorney? Thanks, yeah. POA. I was trying to do letter. It's like it's not a letter of attorney. You can give them a power of attorney so they could actually do the closing documents for you. Um, so these are all like um, different degrees of authority that a principal gives an agent to act on their behalf with a third party. Um, and one of the reasons this matters in this context is um, when you've got, let's say, people that are operating a robot um, you know, with AI uh, that's maybe a DAO uh, to do transactions, whether it's investment fund or whether it's, um, you know, we'll show you some other interesting use cases like a publishing company and other things like that, <clears throat> then that, that entity is going to be interacting with third parties. It'll be doing things. Um, and so we've got this sort of, there's this whole ancient legal framework of agency law, which looks like this. And really what it comes down to is what are the... What, what are each of these parties responsible, what are their rights and responsibilities with respect to the other parties? And a big question is like, what would, would the third party have known that this agent was authorized to show me the house but not sell me the house? Um, you know, to get a furniture but not watermelons or both or one or the other? So there's a, there's a question there and um, we'll talk later about some of the ways we think structurally this can be designed into a legal process uh, to clarify it and have things run smoothly. Yeah, because there are certain ways that you can start granting authority as among the members of the organization such that all of these things are very narrowly scoped and clearly understood so that you don't have the, you know, edge cases where things go terribly, terribly wrong. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, so Tord is another one. Um, you know, we're we're seeing more with uh, autonomous vehicles. There, there are these questions about you know what happens if the autonomous vehicle decides to to hit my car instead of run over the baby. Who's you know who's liable in this situation? Um, and, and what it gets back to is uh, this idea of uh, an accountability gap. So basically, like taking the um, the, the, the analogous situation for if a person was there and then figuring out where the liability would have um, been apportioned if, you know, the same thing happened. So if instead of, uh, you know, this was being driven by a person instead of an automated vehicle, um, you know, the, the liability wouldn't necessarily go to the person except if these five things happen. And then you can point to those five things and kind of have a little bit more of a protection there. Indeed. Good? Yeah, good enough for now. We have so many slides, let's keep, keep moving. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're gonna get to the fun part. That was all kind of like background so that we could set up, uh, you know, the, the things that are the most juicy. Um, so the use cases and the research history. Um, so I'll let you talk about CorpBot. Oh yes, okay, so I promised you there was history. Um, here is some history. Um, so, um, has anyone here heard of the, uh, the firm Robot, Robot, and Huang? <laughs> it's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of real. Um, so, Tim Huang is a very creative guy. He used to hang around here at MIT and Harvard, and he went to get his law degree uh, at um, Bolt Hall at UC Berkeley. And um, he's got this concept of how much of a law firm can you automate, uh, and he's really good with uh, creating autonomous entities. So, in 2011, uh, we collaborated on a, a project called CorpBot, where we just wanted to create some code that would go to a Secretary of State, Secretary of State's office, and um, 
form a corporation and that would conduct a single business function, like sell a book on Amazon, upload a book to Amazon, create an account, sell it, get some money, and then like dissolve the corporation. And so, you know, we made some progress, I'd say, but then um, we all kind of go, what, did some other projects and we never really completed that one. Also, it turns out it's harder to do that type of robotic process automation with legal, with more nuanced legal and business requirements, um, you know, much harder than we thought, but we've been working, at least I've been working on this since 2010, I'd say. And so if we fast forward a little bit, um, in 2016, um, thanks to blockchain, we were able to make some more progress. And so um, one of our, our collaborators at law.mit.edu, and, um, and then we were both partly at the Digital Currency Initiative for this project, uh, she wanted to do a, um, what, she, what she was calling a blockchain border bank, basically like a community bank uh, on the border of um, Haiti and the Dominican Republic to make it easier to get microloans. And so we did what we could to model that. It turns out that was really hard, um, especially with the banking law and everything. So what we ended up doing was a revolving loan fund operating under Massachusetts law, or at least I, I was licensed to practice and I understood what the forms were and it could model it more. And we could test it all the way through without you know, going to Dominican Republic jail or something. And, uh, uh, and, so, we're, and so here's the, uh, this is basically the UML that we, came up with in order to figure out how to do the loan application in an automated way, figure out based on some criteria who we'd issue the loans to and make sure we had the balance on the fund and then um, receive payments and then give them a receipt and check it on the blockchain for every payment that we could show and then to finally um, uh, provide the um, acknowledgement that the loan was paid off, which is a big um, legal um, document um, in their Massachusetts law uh, that you want to be able to show. And we modeled that pretty well, but again, it was a little hard to do the test all the way through. The best way we could figure out how to do it without putting millions of dollars into creating financial institutions was to use PayPal to actually like um, send and receive the money. And at that point, we're like, okay, we've figured out how to integrate our code with a PayPal API, but give me a break. Like, is that even a realistic test with the PayPal fees and everything? So we needed to look further, but we made a lot more progress on modeling the entire entity. Um, and let's go forward. Ah, okay, now we come closer to the present. Even this is a little outdated now, but you want to talk to this yeah, one? Yeah, so this is the fun stuff. So uh, we've been working together on this project uh, like that's related to automated and autonomous legal entities for a while now. And um, uh, we co-hosted a workshop Deza was remotely here, and I was in Berlin with a bunch of the people at Fullnode. And one of the things that we wanted to walk through was, uh, you know, this uh, kind of, it, it's pretty basic uh, schematic for what all of the actions that would be required in order to create a publishing DAO. So, you know, think if you, if you got a network of people together and you wanted to produce a book or something or produce, you know, different books or, you know, start hiring people to write for you, um, like what would that look like? And so what we came up with was, okay, so there's a publishing DAO. The publishing DAO invests in, in order to buy a, like this espresso book machine, which is basically a, uh, a, printing, a printing press, press. for books. Yeah. And then um, you kind of create this smart contract marketplace that allows you to pay logistics partners to pick up the books. It delivers them to the people in the public. The public can deposit money to receive books the deposits go towards a publishing proposal that's either confirmed or denied, and then the, the book itself is printed. And so one of the things that we wanted to see here was, okay, so what legal rights and obligations exist at all of these different steps? And um, one of the things that we kind of came up with and one of the insights that um, we've been really trying to drive home here is that you know, there, there's a really strong need to narrowly scope exactly what a DAO is doing from a legal standpoint so that you don't run into any of the contractual issues, the agency issues, those issues of uncertainty where people might be out of money because um, one of the things that I glossed over before and should have mentioned is if you, if you don't have one of these legal containers, uh, the United States and all these state governments, they'll assume you're a general partnership, which means they can go directly after you for whatever liabilities that the organization occurs. So it's yeah. really important. And just to, to identify the you, that's like 
all y'all. Um, so your every member is jointly and severally liable that and with a general partnership. And what that means is like, if you know, like member one has like an extra Toyota that can be like impounded, and member two has a, a vacation house and you know twenty thousand dollars in their savings account. And member three has whatever you know, like a painting. They can go after everybody until until they've paid off the debt. So yeah. a general he, partnership and like ult, is like ultimate liability exposure. And if you're going to have a legal entity, you don't want later someone to say, "Oh, your DAO was a general partnership." It's better to get ahead of it and to use some of our open source code and to develop it so that you can select the entity and then engineer the legal relationships and roles um, according to um, the business model that you have in mind. Yeah, and that's especially the case if you have member four who lives in a trash can, <laughs> screws everything up, and does something wrong. They get in trouble, then, you know, you lose the vacation home and the, all the good All goodies. good stuff. Um, and Notice this one, by the way, oh. on the last one. Um, so this is an interesting hybrid where the DAO, we played it different ways, where the DAO was a legal entity itself, um, and where um, the individuals... Um, where the DAO is more like a tool or a platform, um, and the individuals maybe had a different corporation, but there's people very much here. So I'd call this um, a, an automated and significantly, like, I don't know, some level of autonomousness, but there's actually humans doing the votes, like, do we like this book? Do we not like that book? Do we want to get in this market? Are we going to push this? Are we going to put more marketing behind this one or not? And sort of choosing the distribution of their um, their uh, resources against um, selecting and then pushing uh, the new materials and who they want to work with. So this is a kind of a hybrid approach um, on the yeah. on the um, distribution. At one end, there's a completely automated entity, and um, you know, like you could create partly automated entities to go and form a new entity. And then you could dissolve the partly automated entities. There's different ways you could imagine getting to a completely autonomous entity that was nonetheless validly a uh, legal entity. Um, that's the far end of the scale. Most of our work here I'd call more practical, where there's hybrid between um, existing businesses, existing business models, human beings very much in the loop or actually in the driver's seat. Um, but then disappearing a lot of the complexity and making things much more responsive to uh, the strategic and tactical decisions you make because it's all encapsulated within a single unified, like integrated legal entity. And so the, you know, you, you'd imagine the bookkeeping, the, um, all the financials, but also like the inventory and like strategy and operations, HR, when you encapsulate all that, you can make we, we believe you can make decisions and adapt at more the closer to the speed of thought and that you can manage uh, and, and um, be much more flexible and it would be a much better form of business. Yeah, and to that end, one of the things that we're also doing right now is uh, we're launching a new publication which is going to come out Friday, the MIT Computational Law Report, of which I am the editor-in-chief and Daz is the executive producer. And the whole goal of the publication is, uh, it's a little bit different than other publications. Um, one, you know, it's focused on law, which is, you know, a new thing for MIT. We're, you know, looking at ways that you can reimagine and re-engineer the law so that it functions more like a computational system. So we have a lot of interest in learning, you know, what does bridging that gap look like? Um, but we also want to, because it's, um, not to, because these aren't two disciplines that have traditionally been connected with one another, we want to do some field building. So we want to have conversations about, you know, how these processes take place. We want to convene people together and, you know, see what the good ideas are. And then we also want to produce content. And that content comes in a few different forms. Um, and this is where we're uh, really excited about what we can do because the content's going to be traditional written articles um, but it's also going to be rich media, so podcasts, video lectures about how to code something so that it can produce some of these things. But it's also even going to have a, like a data playground where you can um, upload a prototype of an app. People can evaluate it, comment on it, deploy it themselves, you know, iterate it. And um, the goal is to come up with better solutions that are accomplishing some of these goals that we've been talking about. Indeed, so this is what we call uh, at MIT pre-competitive research. So this field, as Brian said, field building, it doesn't exist yet. And the people that were working with the companies, law firms, governments, and others, maybe some of you, perhaps, 
uh, are um, interested to find solutions and to find design patterns that work, evaluate them, and then the next step would be, you know, you could choose if you want to invest in a startup or, you know, put something out there in the market. So this is, um, and you, one of the things you, meant, you, you didn't mention that I'll highlight in the data playground is reproducibility. Um, so it's, um, it's hard to, what we really want with engineering the law as a computational system is predictable legal results. So you don't want always to be talking to lawyers and have them say, well, it depends. Well, upon what exactly does it depend? Can we know that up front? Can we engineer a system to achieve predict more, at least, predictable legal results? The answer is yes, we can. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. And we think actually using the scientific method and, and the you know, tried and true, almost like cultural DNA of reproducibility at MIT for some of these experiments to see if we can get the same business, legal, and technical results against some test hypotheses and other test um, regimes. Um, it, we think that's important and that that's um, how we structured the data playground. Yeah, and, and well, and I, I think one of the other things that would be especially pertinent to this group here is um, we're going to have a podcast that's going to come out on Friday that's about the idea of legal primitives. So right. borrowing from the idea of cryptographic primitives, what are some legal primitives that we can come up with that we can really fine tune and allow people to kind of like containerize and take away with them so that they know exactly what they're getting in right. all these different circumstances? Right. So legal primitives, so you could be thinking cave men or barbarians, um, think more like um, building blocks that are fundamental building blocks that you can compose together to create something. So cryptographic primitives are like digital signature, uh, encryption, um, aspects of dual key cryptography. There's, there's these well-worn primitives uh, that are um, reusable. Um, so we're looking to identify some of the legal primitives. Notice maybe, we, the previous speaker spoke about identity, um, a contract. Um, a, well, digital signature, there's some that may have good overlap with cryptography, in fact, but there's some others that are unique to law. Yeah, and so getting through some of the last of these, this, oh, that's actually the uh, the Berlin working group at the top, no, top. that we did. Um, but yeah, we so to, to kind of like accomplish some of these things, we've been hosting these um, these workshops where, you know, we're getting... Um, down here's one of the, the guys who came up with the BBLLC yeah. right. statute the, in Vermont. So this so, is a drill down on the Dorg and like a, like a total demo. This is like a drill down that went for almost an hour and a half on agency law and crosswalking it to DAOs to see, you know, map all the roles, relationships, rights, and responsibilities of the parties and play them against scenarios. Um, this one was, I think... What was that? That one's probably contracts. Yeah, that was the contracts. Um, this was, was no, oh, this was the publishing DAO, and there's a few more. We kind of ran out of slide space, but we do a lot of convening um, as part of uh, as an input to uh, the design and prototype of systems. And um, one of the things that we're really excited about with this first release is we actually have a challenge. So if if anyone wants to contribute to this challenge, we would welcome it. But the idea is that we want to kind of build up this repository of people who are working to produce code that automates certain of these functions. And so, um, you know, if you have, if you're working on like some small piece of it, maybe like, uh, you know, you, you want to understand how to integrate like a voting mechanism with uh, one of these BBLLCs, or if you want to go the other direction and figure out how you can just like automate something in a way that produces certificate tokens, you know, this would be a place where we would very much welcome like that sort of stuff. And um, if, if there's any interest in staying kind of up with these things, we have a computational law telegram channel where you can get involved and kind of spit around feedback and ideas and, you know, start populating the space together with us. Uh, I, th I believe that. Right. Maybe. Probably the best thing to do is to go to law.mit.edu uh, and click on contact or forward slash contact. Join the email list, and we could have a more, even more curated, you know, kind of um, updates of when we're doing things and communication. The Telegram channel is great; like I, I live there, but it can be a little chaotic for those of you that aren't used to like um, dense um, chatter on Telegram. Um, the other, th I feel like we should say something else about this. Um, this, okay, so this challenge also um, is part of the release, the first release of uh, the publication, which is, our soft launch is uh, Friday of this week. 
Um, and the theme of the first release is automated and autonomous legal entities. So several of the articles are on that. Um, some of the um, pro projects are on that. Several of the podcasts are on that, as well as other more foundational computational law themes. Sandy Pentland's got the anchor article where he sets the big vision on what is computational law, and that's that's amazing. And um, and uh, one of the things that I know that we want to work on um, with the conference organizer is actually modeling um, the legal entity aspect of like a robot arm that creates art. Um, so we think that this is a very, it's sort of adjacent to um, a robotic yeah. and, and DAO publishing company. It's something that's more art, but it's not different in kind. In some ways it's a lot easier because the housing of the robot arm actually has a place where we understand how we can Work with work you on code. You know what the robot will do. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, it, it, well, we, we think we do, and then, uh, and so we can start to actually engineer um, against certain scenarios and hypotheses, like what if the artist owns the art, the robot arm is doing something, or what if the consortium that has purchased um, the robot arm are considered the owners? What if the robot um, incorporates itself and is considered the owner? On and on. So there's always sort of permutations on scenarios. And when you have, like, you don't, you can't understand law or legal outcomes in the abstract. Law can only be understood um, when applied to facts. That's why lawyers say it depends, because maybe they don't know all the facts yet. So we think that this will be a great platform to basically engineer all of the relevant facts and then play it against different scenarios to see whether we're getting the expected results for um, the legal roles, relationships, rights and responsibilities and fundamentally the legal outcomes that we're that we're seeking to engineer so um that's um we hope that that will be one of the um challenge results that we can um hack together on and if you have interesting ideas on this um well intersection of yeah. robots ai and law um with respect to legal entities or more generally we would love to hear about them right now we have some time for some open discussion thank you Any questions? Oh. Hi, um, I just want to ask you your thoughts around, you know, you know, checks and balances when it's come to information coming into the lab. I mean, lately I've been quite curious and also interested in um, AI bias data with AI. So how do you, like, what's your thoughts around, you know, sort of filter right information and also checks and balances of information feed into the system. So in other words, um, if, you, if you put garbage in, you might get garbage out. So how do you do the checks and balances on, on your um, proposals? So could, could you, uh, can we go backwards on the slides a little bit? Yeah. Or, uh, I'll do that while you're okay. talking. Um, so, so let me see if I've got this right. The, the, the basic question is like, if, if you're set up so that you know there's some stream of data that you're trying to uh, that you're ingesting as a decision making function in the internal governance of the DAO, like what happens if you know that that data gets corrupted or something like that, and you know it starts producing all of these like terrible outcomes. Um, and, and to answer that, I, I would say you know you you can start to there, there are certain things that you can do um, that would be modeled kind of after uh, like high frequency trading algorithms. You know, so if there are a certain amount of calls one direction or another that signals like something super volatile, you could have it set up so that it kind of just meters off or requires a, like somebody to look at it or the group to get together and to reach some sort of consensus before it can proceed forward. Um, so it kind of like, you, you kind of have to create like a, a legal pause button on like what you're doing to ensure that you're not like going the wrong direction. Um, so that's, that's one thing that comes to, comes to mind there. Yeah, and then um, going further, um, so some of this comes down to just good old fashioned information security. And so, um, you know, if even on a high frequency trading uh, platform, if somebody hijacks it and gives it market, mark information, so that it starts buying other things, of course that's probably crime and fraud, but that is one way you can get corrupted information or garbage in to manipulate activity, um, like through a direct tax or just, you gotta, you know, information security doesn't go away. It's even more important with 
auto automated and especially autonomous systems to make sure that it's getting the inputs that are expected from the oracles or the other sources. But then you also come down to, um, then you also have to be thinking um, beyond like a direct attack, um, whether the sources you've chosen are really appropriate. So I think you mentioned the word bias. Um, so that's a big question that I think um, in Sandy, Pe so for example, if you've got an, like the, um, this system for evolving loan fund, um, the, wait, well, damn, you can't really see the swim lanes um, on this too well, but imagine there are swim lanes. Uh, it didn't come through our JPEG, but um, there are decision points where all of the information for loan applications presented to an, a board and then they make a decision. So the way this system was created is people log in and authenticate themselves and they have authorization to be like N of M approvers to issue a loan or to change the distribution. Like, oh, we're gonna be doing a little bit more high risk loans and more micro loans or that'll be the distribution. So this sort of depends on two things. Number one, making sure that the authorized people are, are logging in to set the parameters and approval chains and sort of workflow points. But number two, are you gathering the right information on the loan application or on your, on your for, on, from like other information that we assume we'd be getting from Bloomberg and other places just to look at what, what the distribution of the fund would be? Um, and this is um, you know, basic business judgment. And, and it's one of the things Sandy Pentland says uh, in, in his What is Computational Law article that we're releasing on Friday is the critical importance on, on the, with the legal dimension of these systems of um, modeling them and then not forgetting about them, assuming that all of your decisions initially were absolutely correct, but instead monitoring and then adapting them. So if it turns out some of the information is biased and you need other information, you have to change the balance of how you're calculating the relevance or weight of different information that's coming in in order to hone the model um, to make better decisions so there's less bias that you don't want, then this, is a, this, this needs to be built into the design of the system. So Sandy very much advocates the computational law systems, everything from creating a statute to you know, managing your contracts or other businesses business types of uh, instruments, um, that, that most of the action shouldn't be on the initial design phase, but it should be on the design of continuous adaptation. And, and the information that might be perfectly good in 2020 may end up being biased and, and not particularly reflective of, of the key inputs in 2021 or 2022, the years 2022. And so you have to continuously hone and identify um, where the bias or the other inefficiencies are as you go uh, with computational law systems. I suppose with any system, but we think this needs to be part of the DNA of computational law. So those are some, some thoughts on what you said. I think what you said raises a lot more questions that <laughs> we haven't got to and that maybe we can't conceive of today. Hey, Adrian. Um, so one of the primitives, maybe not in a sense you meant it, is reputation. Um, n narrowly, uh, reputation issues sort of cross over all of the uh, decentralized AI stuff that we heard about uh, earlier today uh, in all the domains. Uh, where does computational law uh, impact reputation or vice versa? In other words, is there a narrow subset of projects that are already underway, or aspects of the discipline that can be used, that can be applied as a primitive to the reputation components. I, yeah. I think there are examples out there now, like uh, Estonia's got the e-birth certificate, um, Zug's got the uh, land registry that's on Ethereum, and I think these different groups are you know, starting to plot some points down on what um, the factors are of identity that you need to have in order to like properly like indicate or authenticate like what your reputation is and that you're able to do something. Um, and so I think those are some places to start. And then as more and more entities or uh, not entities, but governments and different players start to do this, um, that will become a little bit more clear. Like you'll, you'll start to under, you'll, you'll start to identify more of the general tr trends and be able to say, okay, we've seen that of all these places here, the five most common features that you should look for and go from there. Yeah, I think that's all good practice. And then if we go even a, a little bit deeper into the question of, is there something in there that might be a legal primitive? Um, so I'd say the first one would be something in the zone of identity itself. Like there is a creature, like a human being, or a corporation that has legal personality. And we actually, so we'll release on Friday this um, hour 
um, podcast um, with Drew Hinkus, uh, just starting to identify what we think legal primitives may or may not be. We weren't sure by the end of the hour whether identity would or wouldn't be a legal primitive. There's different ways to look at it. Let's just hypothesize if we considered it a legal primitive and that was there was consensus around that people created reusable building blocks, maybe something like the outcome of NSTIC or something at the, the kernel of an UMA identity or something like that, uh, user managed access identity then you could imagine constructing that primitive, that concept of a primitive, um, such that um, the identity has attributes that may be part of the definition of the primitive, and some of those attributes may be authorization, some may be other identifiers, and some, in fact, may be things that adhere to it, like reputation. So you could imagine if identity were a primitive and it were a basket of identity attributes, some of them could, you could have like a, agnostic sort of like genericized thing that we call reputation attributes. So at that level, I guess there could be reputation that was like a legal primitive, but honestly there's not even consensus um, among the few people talking about legal primitives about how this would play out with identity at all at this point or whether identity is appropriate for a legal primitive. We're just really not sure at this point. So I would encourage, I don't want to be that speaker that puts the question that says a question with a question. Uh, but I would love you to think about that, Adrian, and talk to people about it, and then talk to us about whether you think identity would be appropriate legal primitive, and if so, what the role of, of um, reputation or things that are sourcing from a third party adhering to the identity might be. Oh, I, I that was fast. A, a, a little tiny bit. Uh, the, the link between identity and, and reputation is a context. And um, what's missing uh, because we really don't have any technology or science around reputation worth, worth anything much. Uh, these days, what's missing is introducing, not worrying about digital identity and identity as a legal construct, but rather introducing the principles that I think law can bring into defining the context. In other mm. words, the adjudication of reputation mm. is, or the gaming of reputation, mm. or how do you control the gaming of reputation? Don't bother about the stuff at the low levels that we do in the self-sovereign identity groups. That, that's way too low level, and in UMA as well. But rather, this issue of defining context in the legal sense, in the adjudication or appeal, et cetera. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, Sir, did you switch seats to be in mic position? Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, just uh, two questions, uh, a little bit futuristic. Uh, right now, we are facing with a situation when the supply chain and uh, some processes is really long. And uh, if we are talking about autonomous system and fully automated processes, some, sometimes it's hard to define uh, in uh, some cases, yeah, in, in something happened, uh, something going wrong. It's uh, hard to define uh, who is, uh, wh who will be in charge to, to pay uh, for that. Uh, and in some uh, juridic um, things, uh, such uh, situations uh, really exist when uh, the many participants uh, in the process, for example, uh, of death of the person, uh, and nobody can be blamed because uh, there is a really long uh, chain. There is some movies about that. Uh, but it, will we see something like insurance funds for uh, autonomous systems and robots and AIs uh, to uh, ensure that in any case of damages from from the side of uh, such systems, uh, their all damages will be compensated. I can start us off on that. So to, to me, so the so when you the way you posed it, which I thought was I thought you posed the question really well. Uh, but there's one word I might suggest we amend uh, when you said when you're look, it's hard to know what happened and then who's in charge. But let's to get right to the real point. It's like who's accountable or responsible. Who's going, to bear, who's going to be left holding the bag if something goes wrong. So to look at that at dimension of it, um, what we want to avoid is an accountability gap, okay? Um, and so some people, 
it seems, uh, in the early days of the Dow, especially, were specifically attempting to achieve an accountability gap, where the idea is something's going to happen and you can't touch us, uh, like we're not part of any jurisdiction. And, you know, I think it's very questionable whether that's a, a, a beneficial or sustainable or, or desirable system at all. Uh, but as we look forward from more of the law.mit.edu perspective, we're looking at... Um, um, I guess uh, s systems that operate well based on our social expectations and uh, and that are sort of extrapolate forward from where we're at in society today, which includes accountability. Um, and so, to me, when there's a um, when there are human beings and, and other corporations utilizing automated or autonomous systems as tools, it's not a big change in terms of who, who what's accountable. What you need is attribution at that point. So, to whom do you attribute the act? Um, so as long as that's clear, then everything else kind of falls the same way it would without an automated system. If it were a manual system. Number, but now where it gets interesting, I think closer to your question assumption, is um, what happens when the system is kind of taking actions and causing consequences without human review or approval or even knowledge? Okay, so now we're in the fun zone. Um, so in my in my mind, uh, or I believe that. Um, it is not just possible, but essential that um, if or when more likely these systems start coming online, that a major part of the equation like required is that there be um, um, financial and other mechanisms to ensure there is no accountability gap. And so if one must, if all one has is the automated or autonomous system to hold accountable, then therefore we must look at things like insurance, bonds, reserve funds, on, and things that are proportional to um, the harm or accountability that may be required for the type of thing it's doing. So, you know, if it's selling books that may be relatively low, if it's doing uh, munitions and, you know, um, nuclear uh, weapons uh, distribution, it may be quite high, um, and everything in between. Um, and so, you know, looking at the potential exposure of different business activities is a bit of a magical, you know, art more than a science, but there's risk managers that can begin to size up what would be an appropriate, um, you know, um, uh, um, uh, risk management um, kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, what? A premium? Well, a premium, but the number one would be appropriate risk that. management um, capabilities to have for certain situations, like is insurance appropriate? And if so, what kind oh, of product right, and what yeah. would the premium be? Is Do I need a bond? Do I need like a, a, a liquid reserve fund or other things like that? Or is there a common defense fund? Or d There's a different ways to start to build in accountability, but I'd say that it becomes essential um, and it ought to be built into the process of having fully autonomous systems that are capable of causing harm. Um, and so I guess my answer to your question, like is this something that you know could be thought of? I'd say like, hell yeah. It, it, in fact, I think it must be. <laughs> It must be thought of, and it should really be part of the core design. And, and the second question, it's, uh, I think it's related with the first one. Uh, will we see something like uh, open source license, but uh, for AI and robotics, but not, not the source code, but uh, to open itself? I, I mean, what Eduardo said, uh, if the robot can uh, buy itself, if possible in the future. Will we see something, some license like this? What would the license do? Uh, like, for example, uh, there is uh, in the open source uh, some license there you are putting that I'm not uh, uh, the owner of this code no more. I'm open it to society and uh, I, I'm not uh, take the burden of, of the damages or mm -hmm. any things, but mm -hmm. is it possible the same thing uh, for robots and AI, for example? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Please just to be speak free. To, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think there's a couple of concepts there. Um, one of them is the concept of emancipation. So open source is sort of close, but let's get really point blank on the target. Um, you could, one could imagine one could structure like legal documents and business models and social arrangements where we deliberately intend for some code to be emancipated. So it was owned at some point and at a certain point it sort of owns itself or it, it is independent. Um, it becomes a 
autonomous or we'd say emancipated. So like a, a young person is, um, can't form a contract when they're 12 years old, but it's by the time they're 30 years old, they can. There's one of the things that happens there is we call emancipation. Technically, legally, it's emancipation. A slave, similarly, cannot own property. In fact, they were considered property. When the slave is freed, they are emancipated. So an emancipation um, type of event is one way we can see this happening. Uh, another thing I would call is something I sometimes refer to as the broken leash. Um, and so like you've got this dog or this uh, thing and it's on a leash and it seems to be going pretty well and then the dog kind of bit through or otherwise just like ran off and like the leash is out of your hands or it's been broken. So now we've got this rogue um, AI going around that uh, for all intents and purposes, or, or maybe the leash is, is relinquished because the one, the only person that you know created and owned it and operated it what, is now dead, or they went to jail, or they don't feel like doing that anymore, or what have you. Um, and so th you can imagine conditions that would result in that. I think the interesting question is, um, in fact, I, I go one step further. In 2019, I would say um, I, I envision that this is inevitable. Um, that we will see these things develop in the next handful of years, you know, up to, I'm not going to put a number, uh, but in the future, in your lifetime. Uh, and so uh, then the question becomes, okay, um, how could an emancipated AI or, or robotic or purely software um, be a um, kind of wholesome, healthy, you know, desirable, um, legitimate um, creature on the terrain with us. Um, and so this starts to create questions about what types of requirements or constraints might be appropriate uh, yeah. for that. And this is a question that I think um, it's just about time to have real, realistic conversations about. It. It's still premature, but it's not too premature to start thinking and talking about it. So I'm glad you asked. Yeah, and I think too it gets back to like you know a few years ago there was that uh, like who owns the intellectual property rights for the the monkey selfie where the animal took the the selfie of itself it's like who owns that and and you know one of the things that you can look to in order to determine that ownership is like does a legal personality container exist for that entity so whether it's an animal in certain places animals do have legal personality rights um you know uh i, I could imagine you know if there was some sort of registration process there was some sort of you know indicating of like what those voting mechanisms were, the the decision making calculus that went into it, you know, you could have a legal personality container for robots, you know, what that actually looks like, you know, remains to be seen. But I think we're getting incrementally closer and closer to understanding like what the contours of it look like and so, the inner workings. Yeah, and so one one component, uh, an inner working that would show up on the contour where where you could con connect with it. Um, I think one thing would be something like a license plate, you know, even if it's virtual, um, so that um, you could say, ah, this AI or autonomous um, entity um, belongs to, you know, Acme Corporation or belongs to Sandy Pentland. You know, it's a personal shopping bot thing or what have you. Uh, uh, that AI, when I look at the license plate, like the license plate's visible to others, um, is emancipated. Oh, good to know. Um, well, then maybe before I conduct a deal with it, I should then check, does it have the standard insurance and bonding, or does it not? Um, is it fully paid up? Am I doing something within the scope of its capabilities? Could, is there like a robot.txt file I could query at a standard API to find out more things about who owns it, including it owning itself or being emancipated, what its capabilities are, and what my recourse and remedies would be if it all goes terribly wrong. But I think what we really want to keep our eyes on is it all going beautifully, wonderfully right. So like some of these things, some of these types of entities can be extraordinary for the innovation and the economic prosperity and the social issues that they can help us to resolve and help us to achieve some of these deeper goals. And so what we really need to be doing now is um, fundamental engineering and um, sort of pre-competitive uh, research and development on designing the, um, the types of containers so that we can make we can get the best out of these capabilities while also um, maintaining um, you know, um, reasonable risk um, kind of management and, uh, and also maintaining our values intact. And I think that pretty much brings us to the end of the session. I'm yes. So, so do you have a final question, Fabio? Take mine. From my side, from my side. 
No, I, I, the question is, uh, does uh, already exist a framework which allows, uh, could allow automatic litigation? Because I think to see a situation like that, you have an intelligent tra trading algorithm which has a, a beautiful idea of trades, but this happens not to be legal. And, and so another algorithm detects a, a, a wrong move and uh, open a litigation. So say this, I don't want to pay you because, uh, I mean, in certain context, for example, a car, an autonomous car, not, uh, not wishing to pay a parking lot or in trading, uh, speed, uh, so real-time litigation could be automated, the litigation might be an option. But uh, the question is, is this legal? So we have a, a framework for that. We have a framework for that, uh, so legally. It yeah. could be implemented and automated the litigation on yeah. a trading floor or in, in, on a parking lot. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, last yeah. question. We'll, we'll be quick. So, so you could set up a framework for that, right? Um, so like a lot of times when you enter into agreements with banks or other parties, there are arbitration clauses. Um, you could also imagine like an online dispute resolution process, like what eBay has, what Amazon has. And, you know, those are a lot more efficient than courts are. And so if you, it, if you had something like that set up where, you know, when you're setting up one of these, um, where you're setting up a DAO, you kind of have a checkbox for, you know, this DAO like, prefers this sort of uh, online dispute resolution, but it will do any of the following online dispute resolutions. You know, you could have a situation where, you know, something happens and there's a goal to quickly expedite all of these legal processes and it can automatically run through one of them. Indeed. And so just to play it out quickly, um, so let's take the parking lot. That's a good one. Um, so you have an autonomous vehicle that's going around doing deliveries from Grubhub or something. Uh, it's got an hour between things and, it, and it's more efficient for it to park than for it to circle the block or two hours. So it, goes, so it shows up at a parking garage. Um, it has a RFID chip or something to, so it could be identified and enter and knows where payment would go. One of the things you could structure, which doesn't, so on those components and building blocks, um, if I were a parking garage owner, I might be part of a consortium that developed a standard um, that would ask, can I pre-approve your credit a card for, um, for the amount of time that you'll be staying here um, in advance? And then if I did that, but for some reason it didn't clear when it was time for the car to go, I could have an agreement that it was capable of entering when it came into the garage that I can maintain possession of your, your vehicle until I get payment uh, or something else. And that's where we get into questions like recourse, like, okay, so the credit card was pre-approved, but when I went to do the sale, it didn't go through because you reached your limit or it was a chargeback. Now, if you, if you can check up front as part of a data exchange, interchange, um, that it has a certain insurance, it has a certain reserve fund, then at least you know you have recourse overall so you can let the car go. Um, so I think these are some of the types of design um, design patterns that we would need to look to fill the gap between where we're at now with the components we have, which are close, and where we'd want to be to have things operate more of a fully autonomous way. Does that make sense? But it largely is built upon and just uses the existing systems and frameworks. Um, but um, but they. But we now need to sculpt like more APIs and add a little bit more to like the transaction codes and the business models in order to build out um, full use of the capability. And so with that, I think the full use of our capability is now expired. Totally. <laughs> but like, um, first of all, I think we should like thank like Brian and Dasa, you know, for this amazing last session. So thank you guys. Thank you.